How many people do you think you've saved through Christian nightmares? <laughs> uh, nobody. <laughs> Dude, so you're behind even Sam in the soul winning award. Welcome to Growing Up Christian. I'm Casey. And I'm Sam. And today we're joined by a special guest that we're very excited about. We're calling him Chris, but he's the uh, the founder, I guess, collaborator of uh, the Instagram page Christian Nightmares. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. How are you guys doing? Man, we're doing good, all things considered. It's been a really uh, eventful week, but... Um... <laughs> yeah, to say the least. I guess if you're a professional meteorologist, it helps. Uh, <laughs> if it does, it, there's no shortage of content. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I wish there was. But, uh, th- thanks for having me on. I really appreciate having the chance yeah. to do it. Yeah, we've been t- we've been like messaging back and forth all week. Like, I'm so excited. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just so excited to see where where the angst came from. <laughs> so, Casey and I, um, for the listeners, are. I mean. I, I only I don't know how long you've been following this page, Casey, actually, but uh, a friend of mine referenced me to it. And it's just um, I mean, everyone should definitely go check it out. It really has uh, it encapsulates. I, I mean, the evangelical zeitgeist for sure. But uh, there's a lot of throwbacks to the type of fun stuff that we learned and were taught when we were young. So uh, if you want to be maybe triggered or whatever, it might be worth checking out. So. You've got a lot of great stuff on there. Do people, do they send you things? Do you get to the point now where just people tag you every time they see something crazy somewhere? Um, pe- yeah, people do send me a lot of stuff now or tag me on social media, but a lot of it I still search for myself. I mean, there's just, there's so, like I said before, unfortunately, there's still so much, so much of it out there. Yeah. Man, yeah that there like, sounds like a lot of work actually to, um, can, I don't know, rummage through the, annals of the internet and find some of this stuff i mean i don't know if i'm proud about how much time i've been doing this show. <laughs> um yeah it can be really time consuming but um i'm also i've been doing it for a while and i kind of know where to look and it's it's kind of still cathartic for me you know some some of it's even fun to poke fun at some of this stuff that's just so absurd um but it's really uh, for me it's a venting platform too um and has helped me kind of work through uh, things from my past. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I feel like Casey and I can definitely r- resonate with that as we um, are doing something similar here. <laughs> yeah, it feels good to just um, and make light of it uh, and know and realize how many other people are in on the joke, um, and that it's it's other people are getting something out of it too, and that that uh, having that communication with you. Do you pay attention to a lot of the, like the comments? Do you read through them all and stuff like that? I mean, I don't read through all of them. I do check them out sometimes. Yeah, um, people are funny on that, man. People say some funny stuff. <laughs> there's some really good stuff there for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think like you said about finding other people that can relate to this stuff. I mean, I, for so long, I felt like growing up when in the church, I was constantly kind of looking, you know, around saying, you guys think this is crazy too, and not really finding it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so it is, uh, it is kind of a... Uh, reassuring or, or comforting in some ways to to find this community of people yeah it feels like there's um i mean the exodus is uh, i mean it's been talked about enough anyway but maybe particularly if you're still pay attention to evangelical things it's like a crisis for them uh the mass yeah. exodus and what it feels to me like a lot of people and maybe it's just a lot of my experience but and also because i'm from massachusetts and new england was pretty heavily catholic area i um it feels like a lot of people like my age, I'm um, 32. So basically millennials, a lot of them have parents that were like saved when they were in their twenties, quote unquote. And they were like, maybe they were Catholic and then they joined a Protestant church or maybe they just didn't really, I don't know, but it seemed like there was a lot of baby boomers that got saved in their twenties. And then just like these evangelical churches kind of blew up. And then what we're seeing now is, I don't know what it was that stuck with them or why it, or how it's even changed in a way that is what it is now that's making so many younger people leave. I think that's really kind of a fascinating thing. 
Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think maybe part of it too is, is the internet and, and, you know, um, communities that are, that are, that are sprouting up. Um, yeah. Letting people talk about this stuff. Um, I mean, that's one reason why I do Christian nightmares too, is, I mean, I kind of wish I had it when I was, um, when I was growing up. Yeah. Or like, sort of something like it, or just, I mean, I'm a little older than you guys. Um, I'm in my forties. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I, just just knowing that that there are other people that think this stuff is crazy or that are questioning it, or and being able to talk about it, I, I mean, uh, I I certainly didn't have that, and I think that would have been really helpful. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's so much of uh, the the model for for these types of communities. I think is just, I mean, it's it's almost isolationism. You know, that's yeah. that's a lot of how the group that I grew up in stayed the way it was for so long is it was just, you know, you saw the same people every week. I went to school with the same people I went to church with and everybody was pretty bought in and anybody who came along who wasn't, it just was not comfortable there, you know? So there yeah. was never like that person that you could elbow and be like, do you, does this seem odd to you? Like it was yeah. in everybody's best interest to play along, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. So where, um, oh, we don't have to get into where as we, um, obviously are keeping some things a bit anonymous. Uh, but we, um, what type of church did you, were you affiliated with a particular denomination? Um, what type, what was your kind of like church upbringing? Was it your whole childhood? Did your parents end up bringing you there at some point? Let's get into that. A yeah. Little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I, we went to a Baptist church, uh, okay. all the way through. Um, my mother was, was, uh, was more, was more into it. My, my, uh, I don't know how much I want to get into that, but, um, my father wasn't really on board for a long time, hmm. which kind of, which caused a lot of, uh, conflict between them and in the home. Um, but my mother took us to church and my father allowed her to, to take us to church. Um, and, um, yeah, it was a Bible. It was a, it was a very fundamentalist, extreme uh, Baptist church, like fire and brimstone. Um, uh, you know, so many sermons ended with, you know, if you were to walk out of here today and get hit by a car, you know, we spend eternity. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, we, I, spent, I spent a lot of time at church. Um, so it was, you know, Sunday mornings, it was Sunday school, and then it was the service after that. And sometimes after that, there was a little gathering uh, down in the, you know, the fellowship hall in the fellowship hall. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> like an opportunity to eat out of a brown crock pot full of uh, <laughs> beef and yeah. somebody's pet hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then I, we'd go home and it kind of said, this really sucked too. Like my, you know, my mother was like, this is the day of the Lord. You know, you're, you're not really supposed to do, you know, you're not really supposed to have fun <laughs> on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd want to go, go out and ride my bike or play with my friends. And, you know, sometimes she'd let me, but a lot of times it was, you know, you got to stay in and, and read your Bible. And then Oh, back, wow. That's yeah. different. I, I, I mean, it's, I was familiar with the day of the Lord thing. Like it was, I remember when my, the couple of times that my dad would have to work on Sunday and it was like, I mean, no, one, my parents never made a thing of it. It was like, yeah, dad has to work today. My dad's like a self-employed guy and he has deadlines and he work, he's a hard worker. And, but it's like, yeah. it, if stuff had to, I don't know, he might have something might have gotten in the way of, on Saturday and issue came up at work. So I'm like, but I just remember it being, even though they never made a big deal about it, it, it was so ingrained in me that like, that was like a sin that I would almost yeah. be worried. I'm like, is this the end of it all? Or, I mean, it's going to be collapsing. If we, <laughs> dad's putting work before church. Like full fed uh, Sabbath day that you did. <laughs> I mean, that's, I don't know that I've ever really heard anybody say that before. So that's, that's a new new take on the, on that. Yeah. My mom, my mother was pretty extreme with this stuff. I, you know, I don't know if everybody that went to our church was like that. Um, but you know, there was, that's, that's what Sundays were like. And we'd go back to the evening service on Sunday nights. And then, uh, Wednesdays was, you know, prayer meeting and youth group. And then Fridays were, it was usually some kind of youth group activity that I'd have to go to. But so it was hours and hours a week in church. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I did so much like, I mean, Casey and I were so in such a similar boat Were you, um, so when your mom started about how old were you when you started going to church, was that something you were, I couldn't tell if that's what you were brought up in or if that's something you started going to at a certain age. 
Well, I, I got, you know, born again at when I was five. Oh, yes. Nice. Yeah. So, um, and we had been going to church. Yeah. So really, as long as I've been conscious, okay. consciously remember, uh, we were going to church. And did you, so, I mean, you did youth group. Did you, were you in church like through high school? Did you do youth group all through high school and stuff like that? Yeah, I had to, I mean, I had to, I had to go to church until I, I mean, I was starting to fight back at that point I, in my teenage years. I was, you know, trying to rebel against that and give my mom, mother a hard time about it and try to get out of it every chance I could. But, yeah. but for the most part, I had to go until I left the house. Um, I had to go to church and then, you know, I'd come back from college and, and I'd go uh, reluctantly. Um, and then that, <laughs> at a certain point I, I, I stopped. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm gonna. I want to get into that. What that was like, in a little, a little bit later on, like yeah, the whole stopping point thing, because that's a weird thing. I've heard a lot of people who just carried it out. Like so many people just carry it out way longer than like is reasonable. Like really, when everyone's an adult in the room and can make their own decisions, but it's right. like that guilt. I mean, there's so many people I know who still will still placate that, like and just go to church for their family's sake. But oh no, I had a Dude, lot. Of what's as as a general rule, okay, speaking generally, yeah. what was your guys' like what was your least favorite service of the week? Mine was Sunday night. Least favorite. Ooh. Um I think it was the morning service. I was just I was just always so restless and I couldn't wait to leave, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it did get long. It got long, yeah. And they'd go over, it was, you know, usually an hour or so, but sometimes it'd be an hour and a half and it's I don't know. You're just fidgeting in the pew and it's, and somebody's, you know, talking to you like you're, like you're a bad person. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that uh, that's a very Baptist thing. Yeah, it is. But, I, so was it like big altar calls and stuff like that every week at your church? Yeah, pretty much. And it was off, you know, it was, it was a lot of, um, you know, uh, you, you, you say you're saved, but are you really living for the Lord? You know? And, uh, there's a lot of guilt tripping into, you know, uh, yo, you come to church on Sunday, but you're out in the world, you know, you're watching these R rated movies and you're doing, you know, yeah. whatever it was, it was just, it was, it was designed to, to, to kind of, to make you feel like shit. Yeah. Your tree's I, got no fruit. Man, yeah, exactly. I, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what kind of fruit are you producing? Garbage in, garbage out, blah, blah, blah. Like, exactly. It's, man, I, it's, that's like really the sales tactic, I guess, to get a lot of people to keep coming back. Um, and I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't really that conscious. I'm not sure what level of consciousness there is in that tactic or if the right. people on the stage are just really that afraid everyone's going to hell. But uh, given my experience and the way that Christians live their lives and think in the conversations they have, I don't, I, I didn't get involved in a lot of conversations about that. And I certainly wasn't telling a bunch of people who weren't Christians and neither were my parents. So I find it wildly ironic that like you go to church to be told that you're going to hell if you're not saved, but it's like you're preaching to the choir and then none of those people are telling anybody really the same thing. Like they're not like really propagating that message. It's a very insular group. And uh, my experience outside of um, maybe going to an old folks home and youth group or raking somebody's lawn or doing some church cleanup you're not really doing a lot to tell other people about this thing right, right. you have to know other people in order <laughs> to do that <laughs> yeah right. well you're supposed to be in the world but not of this world right yeah <laughs> right and that is can be broadly interpreted in a lot of ways <laughs> right dude you know what i had a, i had a really funny thought this week and you it it jogged my memory when you said that you got saved at five yeah. um a lot of stuff in my church, like in my church and my school, there was quite a bit of time spent talking about doctrinal differences between our church and other groups of Christians and stuff. And like Catholics, one of the things that they always railed on them about was infant baptism yeah. because that baby is not making that decision. That baby is not capable of asking Jesus into their heart. They really don't even know what's going on and stuff. Yet it was common practice for people to get saved at like five years old. <laughs> right. Like I was really thinking clearly and could uh, develop an intelligent uh, understanding of, of what was being told to me. I know. I remember getting saved. At, I was probably around the same age, man. I was probably about five. And uh, it's just, 
I, it's, I remember it happening because it's like so. I mean, it's basically. What do you What do you want to happen when you die? Do you want to go to heaven or do you want to burn in hell for all of eternity? And you're like, <laughs> I'm five. And they're like, Yeah. So you might want to think about that. <laughs> like, oh, <shit. laughs> uh, I, I'm like, I'll do it like, right now. Let's do it. And then right. you just like, re- then they're like, Okay, repeat after me. And I I remember doing the repeat after me thing and just man, it was it's so strange. I can't imagine doing that to my kids or even I wonder like what my parents were thinking because I mean they're obviously being sold this thing that that's going to happen and they love their kids and they don't want that to happen to their kids and they're like but we just need to take care of this now just in case something happens on the way to school tomorrow but yeah it's like I, he, I wonder if like my dad was like wondering what he was doing or what he thought about it at that time I'm not it gonna was ask just him. commonplace and I yeah. think like that's happening and you're, you know, your kid is, is saying that he wants those things and everybody around you is probably going like, that's great. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, so I'm sure it's easy just to jump in line and go along with it. But yeah, if I have kids someday, I'm thinking, you know, just to illustrate the gravity of the situation, like, could you, would it be wrong to like burn their fingers so that they at least know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know make them touch a hot stove or something and be like you don't want that but all over <laughs> that would get the point across <laughs> somebody's used that tactic we're gonna regret saying <laughs> yeah i know i'm sure you can find some paper like newspaper clippings about uh some crazy shit like that uh so when you were in youth group i mean most people obviously usually uh the disillusionment or reconsideration or questioning starts happening in high school yeah, it, it didn't. Ha- and you said that's kind of when it started for you and you started rebelling. And I, I, I was a, I, I, I was a full buy in kind of guy. So like I, I got the people who had the questions are the ones that made me nervous. Like I was like, oh boy, we can see what this is. <laughs> but um, what was that like? I guess so. When did you start having these questions of like, I don't know about this? And then, um, were did you ever, uh, it, discuss that or mention that in youth group or you did you become any type of person who who kind of was quote unquote that guy or did you just kind of just do it just to get it over with until you had, couldn't didn't have to anymore no i definitely spoke up but i usually did it more through humor kind of okay you know, like make wise cracks and um but I, I if i can back up for just a minute yeah um you know one thing that I realized later on in life is that, you know, I, I remember, you know, saying that prayer, becoming born again w- uh, with my mother when I was five years old. I remember doing it because I knew she wanted me to do it. Hmm. Uh, and a part of me, you know, d- didn't, you know, like the way you presented it is like, you know, do you want to burn in hell or do you want to go to heaven? I mean, I, that I, I was afraid of those options or of the, the option of, go, you know, the, uh, afraid of the potential of going to hell. Right. But I never, I don't know if I ever fully believed. I don't, I don't think I did. And I think that that caused more, uh, you know, kind of turmoil for me in the sense that um, I was always questioning my salvation. I was always, uh, I was, I was terrified that, you know, I think I believe this, but I don't really know if I believe this. And actually I'm not sure if I believe this. Um, So if they're right, I'm, I'm really screwed, you know? So I was, Oh man, that's actually, that's fascinating. I, uh, so do you feel like, and I, I, do you feel like because it was the environment you were in, you had this understanding that it could be true? Like, even though you didn't believe in it, was there like, it sounds like there might've still been that fear of like, I don't believe in this, therefore I'm going to hell. Even if you don't believe in it and you don't believe in hell, it still feels like that's what's going to happen. Was there any of that like back yeah. and forth? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, I was, it's not that it was like, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I believed in it, but I was too afraid not to believe in it. Yeah, that makes sense. I Um, I mean, I remember when I stopped, when I started to stop believing in hell um, and I'm like, I was, even though I didn't really believe it, I'm like, ah, fuck now I'm, that's where I'm going because I don't believe the right stuff anymore, I guess. And it really, it's like a weird thing to work through. So yeah, I was, I mean, I was really paranoid all the time. It made me kind of OCD too. Like I, I was, I was confessing my sins all the time. I, I, I used to kind of develop these rituals that I had to do before I went to bed at night. Um, 
you know, cert- doing things in a certain order and then saying this, this, same, this one prayer every night I, I had to say in order to be able to fall asleep. And I think I was just kind of trying to uh, create some kind of semblance of control um, when I felt like I didn't have any control or somebody else might be in control, but I didn't really believe in this person who was supposed to be in control. And yeah. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but it was, yeah. just, it was very confusing and, and uh, made me very anxious. Uh, I think that resonates with a lot of people, man. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I, I know, I think a lot of people will hear that and be like, Oh my God, I was really in a similar. It's almost like, you know, it was actively preached like in, in my circles that you couldn't lose your salvation. Like once you were in, you were in, nobody can pluck you out of his hand, all that. Yeah. But you still had this like nagging feeling in you, in the back of your head that like, you're not actually in, like you didn't actually believe enough. You don't seem to be having the same experiences as these people. And those people, like there's something fundamentally off about how this relates to you as opposed to how it relates to everybody else. And I definitely, I think that's a, that's a good point that the control aspect of it, you just want some way of knowing for sure that this is right and that you did it the right way and that you're, you're good, you know? No, that's exactly it. I think. Um, Did that, was that experience that you were having um, as like a high schooler, as a teenager? That was pretty early on. I mean, I was pretty young. It it kind of grew the older I got. Um, um, You know, even at, like, like I said, even when I was five, I remember kind of, doing it not because I really felt compelled to do it, but more because I was trying to make my mother feel better. Um, you know, I, I don't know how long, I'm, I, I don't know exactly when it started to grow into more kind of serious doubt. Um, but, uh, but I, I certainly for years and years, you know, even now, um, I still have kind of, you know, these kind of rituals that I do. It's more superstitious, even though I don't even believe in that. But, um, and, you know, I haven't really told many people this too. Like I, I pray sometimes still, um, yeah. even though I don't believe it, but it's more like, pr- it's more like knocking on wood for me or something hmm. because I, uh, it's just something that I've kind of was ingrained in me that again, this, it, it makes me feel better, not because I feel like I'm talking to somebody, but there's something about, um, I don't know, like feeling like I have to do it in a superstitious kind of way. Yeah, I totally get that. I I think that that makes sense to me a lot. I feel like I was kind of in that same boat, you know, or did you ever get the feeling like, um, you know, you never felt like you prayed enough or did devotionals enough or whatever, you know, you always felt lacking in all those things. Yeah. And then when you needed something or something bad happened or something, you know, your, your, your impulse was to pray about it. But then you also had this feeling like, I haven't, I haven't been praying and stuff like I'm supposed to, like, I wonder, you know, I don't want God to think that I just come to him when I'm, when I've got a problem or something, you know, cause they talked about that at church and Sunday school and stuff. Right. Yeah. Like that guy who you haven't talked to in a year and calls you up cause he's moving, needs a hand. <laughs> I remember that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember That's being exactly. that guy. And I also uh, still feel bad that I think the last time I saw a particular friend was who I hadn't seen in a long time. I moved to an area where he was and I was like, yeah, I'm moving to this area. I'm looking for people to help move. Like, he's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And that was the last time I ever saw him. So I'm a piece of shit for that. But. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't need to bring that up. <laughs> Everybody's done that to somebody. It was, that, that, it was like an Aesop rock song where he talks about that. <laughs> Should take like five seconds. So, okay. So high school, you start to, maybe verbalize those doubts and stuff a little bit, even if it's really just, you know, you're alluding to it through humor and stuff like what, what happened after high school? Did you go to college or? Yeah, I did. I, um, yeah, I left, I left home and I went to college. Were you like, is it, um, I don't, if you don't want to get into where that obviously is totally fine, but was mm-hmm. it close to home? Were you able to go back home or were you far enough away or did you just kind of stay at college? Like, what was that like as far as getting, going back home from time to time? Yeah, it was close enough. It wasn't too far from home where I could go back uh, when I wanted to. But you you were living there at co- in I, college. I was living. Yeah, I was living there. Yeah, and it was in a city, and and I loved it because it was you know I grew up in a kind of a small town, and 
and in this in this church community and you know all of a sudden i'm in the city and i had all these options for you know culture and and music and 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 i just had freedom to do what i wanted to do yeah secular uh, college it was yeah so oh, that's yeah, where you went yeah. wrong. was there any were, did you, were you try, did anyone in your family try to push you into a christian <laughs> to say what you said casey yeah um, they, they did um but i i really pushed back on that um and my brother uh i have an older brother he went to uh he went to like a bible college for like a year and then he transferred to a uh to a secular college oh okay did um how do do you have um the disillusionment like this set in with him in a similar way or was it kind of just did he stick did your brother stick with it no yeah that's um we kind of are complete opposites in that way. Um, yeah, he really stuck with it. He still does to this to this day. That's fine. Is that something you guys talk about much, or do you just kind of leave that conversation to the side? We've we're able to talk about it. Um, you know, it doesn't get ugly really. Um, we don't agree, um, and we've kind of learned that we're that we're not going to we're only going to go so get so far with it. Sure. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think he still is legitimately concerned for my soul, hmm. <laughs> um, and and will kind of express that at times, and uh, and politically we're not very aligned, so that uh, gets a little uncomfortable. We just kind of we kind of avoid it until I can't shut up anymore. I can't hold it in back anymore, and I'll get my jabs in. The politics um, is worse than the religion when it, between families at this point. I, I heard, yeah. heard this poll, like a study, whatever. It was like a polling thing that was done by, I think it was Pew Research, but it was like, it it had to do with like, would you rather your child marry somebody of a different political affiliation or a different re, like religious affiliation? And yeah. I mean, I think back in the seventies and eighties, it was like, Oh, definitely political. And that's fully swapped now. Like most Christians are like, I mean, if they don't marry someone that's a Christian, I guess that's fine. As long as they don't marry a Democrat or a Republican, right, right. whatever you are. And it's like, yeah. dude, it is. <laughs> and so it's just funny that like the soul is what's at stake, but everyone's just like, ah, we'll table that discussion because <laughs> the politics is the real issue. <laughs> right. Thanksgiving is going to get way too uncomfortable with that. Oh my God. Yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> I guess it was great. Like, <laughs> need to go. yeah you had fun on thanksgiving i think casey yeah. i canceled mine so <laughs> man do your does your family know about your page um no uh, except for my father actually um uh, he's yeah i'm not sure how to talk about this but um he, you know he didn't grow up going to church with us at, but at a certain point um he started uh, he started coming to church and I think, I think it was more just to keep the peace. Yeah. Um, do you remember about how old you were when that happened, when he started going? Um, I'm going to say I was maybe, maybe 13 or 13 okay. or 14, 13 or so. Yeah. Um, but he's actually very, um, you know, and he goes to church and he, he sees the problems with it. I mean, I think he does it to, to, to make my mother happy. Um, but he, he can extract some, some things from it that are, that are, uh, useful for him you know he's he's down with jesus which yeah <laughs> you know he did no he does you know values the teachings of jesus um he he realizes that especially the the brand of christianity that you know the kind of church that they go to is is pretty extreme at times um but him and i are able to talk uh, he actually he he's supportive of christian nightmares um he asks me about it he checks it out every once in a while and and uh he 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 likes it. Man, do you think that's awesome, man? I, I, that's really neat. I um last time I got into a conversation about certain things with a family member, it turned <laughs> pretty volatile, yeah. and that was entirely not my fault. But um, do you think when you were, because obviously if you're if you're a teenager when your dad decides to start going to church, um, I imagine that had some influence or a pretty big influence on the requirement or the necessity of a buy-in um, as opposed to someone whose both parents are every there every time and they seem to have like a buy-in to the fullest extent like maybe yeah. my upbringing 
Casey's, but like I, I knew a couple kids who had um, who had a father that, and the church loved to talk about fathers and their role and that stuff. But they they um, right. they didn't have a father going to church, or maybe not all the time, or they didn't really care that much about it. And those ones always were like felt more comfortable just being like, maybe I don't have to then. And the, obviously, that's what the church is kind of afraid of when they have the dads not going. But yeah. right. Yeah, I think there was a little bit of that. I think that it was, you know, my mother was all was was all in, and my dad, you know, I guess I was in some ways looking at my father saying, saying, you know, well, he kind of thinks it's bullshit too, you know. So <laughs> related to that, although it was funny, I don't know, if funny is the right term, but um, I remember what, so eventually my father ended up going forward. And, you know, at an altar during an altar call. And I remember it so clearly because I was watching him during the service. He, he wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> he was kind of <laughs> like staring out the window and, you know, and then the altar call came and he, he was, you know, just kind of emotionless, just kind of buttoned up his sports coat and just walked forward. And I was kind of like, what are you doing? You know, hmm. like, and my mother was real emotional and she kind of, you know, was able to, uh, you know, everyone was surrounding her and hugging her and like, you know, he's finally come to the Lord and, and I get why my father did that. Um, but I was kind of a little disappointed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I could see that. I, that would, yeah. Especially if like, if you're struggling with whether or not this is for you and you're kind of getting the feeling like, even if in some form this, you know, I believe some of this, but you know, this group of people is, like out of their minds and on some things like him being the one person in your life, you're like, well, dad's cool. And he's not into this. That, yeah. that has to be kind of a shock to the system. Yeah. Seeing him, you know, do it. Do you think, uh, do you think that was part of that? Like keeping the peace sort of thing? I think it was. Yeah. And I don't really hold him against, you know, hold it against him. I, you know, I think he was just trying to, to keep the peace and, and, um, you know, my parents would fight about it like crazy. So, I mean, I, I, I get why he did it. Um, but yeah, I kind of felt like I had an ally and it, it, it just felt a little, little strange. Um, yeah. That day watching it go down. Did, um, man, that is, when did, when did you, so uh, yeah, you go to college and you're not home all the time. You're not home on weekends. Um, throughout college as you would come home uh at what point did you just like decide to stop going to church and did you eventually just explain to your mom that like yeah i don't really believe in any of this and i'm interested to know what that was like yeah um for you know for a few years i think through college and even after college a little bit you know i'd go home and i would reluctantly go to church um i start you know i'd start to push back and my mother was really good at guilt trips and um, <laughs> And, and I think I just had a little guilt too. I, I, there were times when I thought like, well, have I strayed from God? And am I, you know, um, you know, is, is this something that maybe I need back in my life or, you know, mm. I don't know. Um, but I remember, I remember, I think the, the final, um, what made me decide never to go back was it was an Easter Sunday and, um, and there was, there was an altar call and I, and there were, um, and it was the same old kind of, you know, um, where do you know where you're going to spend eternity and, you know, talk about hell. And there were, there were some little kids that were going up and were like bawling. And there's something about that that just really hit me. And I just remember thinking, fuck this. Like, I'm not, I don't want to be a part of this. And yeah, it like felt icky. Is that what you, like it felt really gross? It felt like here's these kids, these little kids. They're that are, are do they really understand what's going on? Are they just confused? Are they crying? I don't think they're really crying because they're filled with the spirit. I think they're maybe they're crying because they're super confused and scared. And yeah. uh, and I, it just I, you know, I just looked at it and said, this is this is this is awful. This is fucked up. This is kind of a form of child abuse in my opinion. And I, I don't want to be anywhere near it. So that was the last time I ever went to church. Did you, were you with, that was with your parents? Like when you were there? Yeah, my, yeah, I was with my family. Yeah. Did you express that to them? Like after the service? I don't remember having a conversation about that with them. I think that then the next time I came home, I just, that's when it really kind of came to a head. My mom yeah. was like, oh, church tomorrow. And I was like, nope. <laughs> you know? And we got into a fight about it. And then we fought about it for a long time. Every time I'd come home, 
we'd get into fights about it. But wow. finally, she she just stopped, struck, stopped trying to push it. You know, one of the things that I think I was talking to somebody this week that it was a interview and the guy that was talking, you know, he hadn't grown up in a Christian home. So a lot of this stuff was just foreign to him, which is foreign to me. It was like it's there's things that you assume about other people when you're talking to them that just, you know, they're not always true. But what I was trying to explain to him on you know, we were talking about some of these weird things like this, like with kids, you know, where how, how do people square with the idea of scaring kids into doing this or of pushing kids into these big decisions and stuff? And I don't think if, if you didn't go to one of those churches, it's hard to understand that, like, from that person's perspective, this is the best possible thing that could happen. And yeah. regardless of the, the means it takes to get to that end. Like the end is the most important thing in life period. Like whatever happens here is inconsequential. So long as you end up in heaven at the end of it. And that opens the door for some really weird practices and manipulative uh, tactics, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I often wonder if they're, um, I mean, cause psychologically speaking, not that I have any psychological expertise. So people can probably completely ignore me, but, uh, it feels like, I mean, especially with these bigger churches where you like, you see the emotional appeals going on. Um, I mean, I don't know if you were far enough out of, um, Christianity or at at that, at this point, um, or if you had any understanding or familiar with that, like Mark Driscoll, when his fall from grace. Oh yeah. Okay. I covered, I covered him a lot on Christian nightmares. Okay. Yeah. Um, cause when I, when I was at Liberty, um, Liberty University, I <laughs> you shared some fun stuff about that. They um, they had I, I would listen to his sermons because I was you know I was still into it and I, I'm trying to figure this stuff out. Like I'm like I don't know. Like he, he had slightly different perspectives for actually for a Liberty student. He was a bit on the edgier side, um, yeah. theologically speaking too. Not just because he would say damn sometimes. Um, or talk about sex too much and like a fucking perp. He ended like really looking back on some of the things he's like, I mean, he's a pervert. Like there's a a weird, weird guy, but um, he just had this, like everything about it. Like he would talk and you're just like hypnotized almost. You're like, I'm in like the, the, the passion that he had and the way that, I don't know, it just, it seemed to always work. And, and you see that. And obviously like, those are always the people behind mega churches. And it's just always like, yeah. Oh, look, look at the Lord blessing us. And you're like, I don't know if you look at the common themes, it seems like you're just, you're just manipulating people when you're all kind of the same people using the same tactics. And I don't know if they studied those tactics and then knew that that's how you get people or if they're, they're just narcissists that learned by their behavior that they could, they could convince people of things by being a certain way, but it does. I think, yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're good. I, I, I've been talking too long. I just, that's what I think of when I think of like sweeping these people up into it and like, and, and convincing everyone to rally around to these things. And I don't know. That's just, I mean, I think that guy was a raging narcissist and, and home, super homophobic and misogynistic and, <laughs> um, and many other things. Um, I also think, I think I read too that he, he, he might have studied marketing at some point too. That would make sense. I mean, um, he, but I think you're, I mean, I think, I, I think you're right. I think that he, um, people like Mark Driscoll are aware of, of the effect that they have on people and, and they kind of exploit that. Yeah. I, I still, I'm trying to process whether or not it's like dirty because they're doing it. Like, I, I, I think the outcome is obviously the a problem, but I always am curious I, and there's no way to know and you can't get in someone's head, but is it, is there, are they genuine or are they not? Like, even you can talk about like Jerry Jr., Jerry Falwell Jr. Like, I get the feeling that he was genuinely just a dirt bag, but, <laughs> but there's so many other people that I, I can't tell. And that's what's like, I think I get really frustrated by being unable to tell if like they just, if they're, they're responding the way they are and doing what they do because they're getting their egos stroked and they like it more than they actually it, even understand. I don't know. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. It's it's who can say for sure. Um, somebody like Mark Driscoll, though, I mean, I, I think he did get kind of found out in the end with, you know, many 
many church members said that he was abusive. You know, there were scandals with his um, paying to get his book on the New York Times bestseller list and all of that. So I think that was pretty ego driven, in my opinion. Um, but can we talk about Jerry Falwell Jr.? I I want to, I mean, I want to talk. I want to hear from you guys a little bit. Having yeah. Down to Whitley. Uh, yeah. We actually didn't end up. We were kind of getting this whole thing started um, and trying to figure out where we were going with this when all of the stuff with him even happened. And then it was just not like in the, it wasn't culturally relevant. I mean, it's always still relevant, but it wasn't timely. So we just never really revisited it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny, man. I mean, with I, my first year at Liberty was when Jerry Jr. Um, became the president of the school. And it was, it was pretty obvious to me, uh, despite being, you know, an evangelical at the time that he was not, uh, not that great, I, I guess. Not, <laughs> he was off putting. There's a lot about him that I, I, I was just like, you weren't, no, I wasn't sold on. I don't think other people were the kind of the way they set it up was like, um, Jerry jr. Got the school and, uh, Jonathan Falwell, his brother got the church because Jerry senior had them both. And he kind of yeah. just like, divide those responsibilities amongst those kids and and but what was wild go ahead casey i want you to just say some stuff about it before i just keep rambling (laughs) i i remember like i I didn't have a negative impression of jerry jr right off the bat uh i remember thinking of jerry senior as just being like you know he's a nice old guy He's just got some bad views about, it. you know, you can give any 75 year old person a microphone and they're probably going to say some stuff that doesn't really cut the mustard anymore. <laughs> but I think when Jerry Jr. first showed up, he just seemed like this kind of quiet, awkward dude. Serial killer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I see. I was really put off by Jonathan and I don't really remember why. I just remember going to Thomas Road, you know, which is the church. Uh April and I went there like when, when he was preaching and I just, I just did not like him. I got real greasy, like televangelist vibes, but you know, that might've been a misinterpretation. I don't know anything about Jonathan anymore, but Jerry jr. Just seemed like he was a uh, background player that got thrust into the spotlight, but he was kind of like this quiet, not a real well-spoken guy, but he, him and, Becky seemed nice initially. Like they seemed like they were just nice people that wanted to do nice things for the school. I think, uh, you know, Jerry as a whole, like Jerry Jr. You you talk about like these other prominent evangelical leaders and I'm kind of like a big uh, cult fanatic. So, (laughs) you know, you listen to like a whole bunch of stuff about cults, like cult leaders. It's a very specific archetype that ends up, heading up a cult you know they're narcissists but they tend to have like certain abilities and stuff that that bolster their positions within those communities i don't think jerry jr has those like i don't think if if he wasn't handed this empire if you want to call it that there's no way he would have ended up in that seat like he's not like a man (laughs) of ambition the school did well for itself financially after he took over but I don't know how much of that was him or maybe he's just a great businessman and he's just a really non charismatic leader, but he started like early on started like shooting his mouth off and making like ridiculous statements. I forget what was the first one that he weighed in on. That was like really prominent. Was it Trayvon Martin? I don't, I don't remember. There was one, he, one of the things that really set people up, he said something about um, like basically that, he has said something really problematic about Muslims uh, a couple of times when it's just like death threaty about. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember he was speaking in front of Liberty to the students and, and um, there had just been a shooting and he, he, he bragged about carrying a gun on him at the moment. Yeah. 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 Like, was that? Yep. Was that right. And then he yeah. said, um, you know, if, we, if, if all of us had had one of these, we could have ended those Muslims before they got to us yeah. or something like that. Yeah, it's not he. So it it was funny, man. I mean, while they were there, Jerry Jr. and Jonathan Falwell did not get along, and I think that was mostly Jerry Jr. being a douche. Um, But Jonathan was—I don't know—he was. I I didn't really know him or anything. I just—I occasionally was at Thomas Road too, Casey, and he was. 
he just had a phony vibe, but I think he just picked up on how to preach by a school that teaches people how to preach. Like, I, I don't know that there was anything like, I think I always found him to be a fairly genuine person. I've still seen no dirt on him. So that's, he's doing better than the rest of the Falwells. Um, Jerry's hogging all the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to get him into a an interview, you know, like a live interview situation. And be like, "Hey, uh, for the fans at home, did you ever let Jer- uh, Jonathan watch?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm no, like, you've, you've had some funny stuff about uh, about that situation. We've been we, you know, we're sending back and forth long before all this, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. I really resent that guy for, I mean, well, there's just, there's all the hypocrisy for one of, yeah. you know, liberties, you know, uh, their code of ethics versus <laughs> what they were doing. Um, and then also just the platform that they gave, you know, right wing evangelicals leading up to the, to the election. And, and then, um, and then essentially handing, you know, his big vote of confidence, his, his endorsement of Trump was huge, you know? Yeah. It definitely set, um, I think it, it did. I don't know. He's because Jerry uh, Jr. was weird because um, people didn't really look to him as like a, a spiritual authority, but there were plenty of people who were just conservative that ended up getting behind him that used him as a, as a, I don't know. They were like, oh, he said it. And then it, it definitely encouraged things. I, I think I still find uh, one of the things you just said about, um, Casey about him just like inheriting it. Uh, Liberty was basically, it's like the similarities between Jerry Jr. and Trump are really striking. So it makes sense that Jr. Yeah. would absolutely <laughs> be infatuated with them. They're, it's like they were just both given something and worked for nothing and actually now have nothing to show for it. So <laughs> I, I think that Jerry, over the past, you know, 10 years here, I think that he wants to be like that. Uh, you know, quote unquote, he, he wants to speak for the Christian community in a political sense. You know, he wants to be like the like the dad. shock jock of Christianity. But I think he's bought his way into that position. Like, why are all these, you know, right wing evangelicals and stuff coming to Liberty and speaking there? They're courting a lot of money yeah. in that from right. that organization. I mean, that's one of the things he's under fire for most recently here is creating like this super PAC that basically didn't do anything except for Facebook advertisements and funnel money to the Trump campaign. Yeah. It's so wild. In other words, he's really smart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, because he, he was trained as a lawyer and all the, all the trouble they've gotten into, he has like, I mean, he has the answers on why he isn't, like he's still not in trouble. Like all the shit in Florida with the hostel and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, he, he, he knows how to legally not get in trouble while being a complete scumbag. And it just, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't just, he doesn't And he consider, but that's the other thing that people admire about Trump. You're shrewd businessman. It's like, no, you fucked people over and you did it legally. That just makes you an asshole. And that's, shouldn't be, <laughs> if that's capitalism to you, go fuck yourself. Like that's not a good way to look at the world. Chris, Especially, what's, what's yeah, been your totally favorite, know. like, uh, like scandal like this to I mean his favorite's a weird word to use but <laughs> what's been the one that's been like the most enthralling for you oh man I, I don't know it's it's it changes it's it, it's happen it's happening so fast now it's yeah. over the past four years I mean there's always been scandals you know in, you know involved with evangelical Christianity but especially during these Trump years it's just been it just seems like there's one right after another um, I know yeah, I don't know what my favorite. I, I don't. Yeah, I, it wouldn't be favorite. I mean, it's it's unfortunate that these things happen. Um, I mean, the liberty one was favorite, favorite, like that job to cover. I guess maybe that would be easier. Um, it's not as you, I I I guess um, it's nothing as as big as like liberty, but somebody that just really gets under my skin is Franklin Graham. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, <laughs> just. Uh, just his his just his hypocrisy and his double standards and you know things that he said about Obama when he was president versus how he just went was totally aligned with Trump no matter what yeah um, just I you know I like to keep an eye on him and kind of um, 
highlight his his uh, his hypocrisy as often as I can. Yeah, he tweets oh, a good bit of a weekly job. <laughs> <laughs> All of his tweeting, it's like it's he's pretty much just writing your material for you in some ways, right? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, he's just, and you know, he also, there was this one, I shared it on Christian Nightmares. There's a video of him. I mean, he said a lot of, of, uh, of really shitty things over the years, but one, there was this, there's this one video clip of him talking about the gay and lesbian agenda. And, <laughs> and he says, you know, uh, he says, you know, gays and lesbians can't have children. Um, and uh, the reporter said, well, they can adopt. And he said, well, no, they can recruit. And oh God! Oh, he said wow. they could, and the reporter said, "Recruit," and he said, "Yeah, they can recruit uh, children into their cause." And I thought that was one of the most hateful, insensitive, um, just one of the shittiest things I had ever heard. You know, yeah. and, and and nothing, in my opinion, to do with with the teachings of Jesus. And, and the irony isn't lost that his entire uh, career has been built off of recruiting people into the cause. Right, right. Uh, yeah, he really bothers me. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how, um, you know, I think the common theme uh, with a lot of the stuff that you post is, um, I mean, obviously some of it's just funny and silly and yeah. whatever, but I mean, the, the common theme is that like, literally these people who, are, I mean, a lot of them pastors, um public figures in some way or another, but who co-opt uh, at least Christian rhetoric. But it's like, I've always found it somewhat at least clear on what it, what, what it looks like when someone's looking like Jesus versus when they're not like, you're like, that person's doing a lot of good stuff. That person's really great. Like it's very clear what like those people look like. Um, and I'm just like, yeah. what, and how he talked and how we dealt with things. Um, but I'm like, every time these people speak and say these terrible things, you're just like, I'm, I, I don't even know if they know they're being hypocritical. Maybe they think they're really just in a war. And if they don't say these things and everyone's going to believe the other side, like I, but it, it so clearly doesn't look anything like Jesus that I don't really even understand how they got, how people are giving him a pass on it so so casually yeah and they still have they still have so many followers and supporters and yeah i mean i i wanted to ask you if you don't mind just just quickly getting back to liberty like it seems like i feel like jerry Falwell jr is going to be back before we know it in some you know in some way maybe not at liberty but in you know as a spokesperson for you know as an evangelical spokesperson in some way i, I yeah really think that um, but do you think that liberty will be affected by by any of this, or is it? It just seems to me like these things happen, and then there's really no fallout. I mean, there's there was a media, you know, there was a lot of media coverage, or but are are, are kids not going to want to go to liberty now? I don't think it's having any. If I think their numbers grow every year, it's yeah, <laughs> I just, it's baffling. I don't, <laughs> I don't, man. It's so interesting though. Yeah, I mean, you're. It's like because. Their numbers keep growing, but what you would get like from people there is they go to the school and they give it their money, but all, like most of the kids there would be like, yeah, I mean, I don't really like the way he speaks and that doesn't really represent, even though there might be Republicans or con conservatives or whatever, um, they would say like, oh, I, I, but the, you know, I don't really buy into that way of thinking or whatever, but you know, Liberty is still a good Christian school that teaches the Bible that does this and that, like the, the number of excuses, the like items in the excuse corner, just so far outweigh the name of Jerry jr. For these people that they just right. like, keep throwing money at it and turning it into an even bigger amusement park. Well, and this is like the most recent thing and obviously the biggest, but, you know, there was another scandal that they were involved in right after I left, like a couple years after I left. And Sam, you may have the details more so than I do, but um, the president of the seminary at Liberty when we were going to classes there was this guy named Ergen Canner. Yeah. And his big thing was that he was a, a born in Turkey. He grew up a devout Muslim in a Muslim family. 
and then converted to Christianity. And he was like exiled from his family and disowned and this and that and the other. I don't remember all of the stories. And this guy, he was charismatic. Like yeah. I took one of his classes. Mark Driscoll it was a three hour group. Yeah. And he, he taught a three hour new Testament class. You know, you had to take one and it was kind of like, you want to get into Ergen Canner's class because it's, it's not that bad. He, he was very entertaining. I mean, you'd sit there for three hours and listen to him and actually like enjoy it. But it came out. Uh, I don't even remember how that his whole origin story was a lie. <laughs> he wasn't actually, I don't even know if he was from uh, Turkey, but he wasn't like a converted Muslim. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. I don't think he, like it, and he would talk about under knowing extreme, like understanding Muslim extremism because that's what he was raised around. And like, he really, yeah, very brought topical it. At the time. yeah, yeah, of course. Very topical. And he, man, yeah. And he had a lot of people like kind of hanging on the edge of their seats trying to like waiting for what he was going to say about them because have a new hot take and and then it, people like that you could excuse and this all this is i mean we've seen this tactic played out a bunch but you can um excuse their xenophobia because um because they're f- like from it um you know, and, and so now you're like well but i know a guy who who even grew up in it and says and you get just get to like it, it makes your message that much stronger you know Right. I I had a friend who I'm trying to do this as like I want to do this as vague as I can, but I, I have a friend whose dad had um some somewhat of a prominent role in like the I I was gay, but then I got I got saved, and then you know I got uh, and then he ended up in like a monogamous marriage and inspirational figure. And, yeah, yeah, and it was like that was his story, and it was like people really looked up to him in the, in his area for it. Um, you know, it was a prominent guy in the church and it was like, but his, you know, his, the, they ended up getting a divorce, uh, at one point. And, but that the son of that guy was someone that I had known and he, he's gay. Uh, but he didn't come out until he was like so much older and because like the oppressiveness of that environment of like his dad was like the poster boy in their environment for it. You can not, you can choose not to be gay. And it right. fucked them up pretty bad uh, as a kid in a lot of ways, like just having to like deal with that and, and maybe feel like it could be true. But then also like, you know, his dad was considered this shining example and he, he saw all the problems in the parents marriage and things like that because he's, you know, his dad was never really, made he never wasn't gay like it didn't fix it uh it's just like right. you you faked it for long enough or that environmental group think allowed him to to make the changes for a temporary moment in time but it was man it was like so tough on him and it's like but i i only throw that story out there i guess because it feels similar to like he was the one that evangelicals would use when they would talk to their friends but well i know someone like that and they're not anymore so like people Use want to just, yeah 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 <laughs> they like need to build, <laughs> they want to build these stories up because you need the anecdotal stories that are powerful because there isn't enough actual evidence of any of the shit working yeah definitely. that's a long way of saying that it's it's not going to have any effect <laughs> <laughs> they're going to keep going but um i want to uh I don't know, Casey, did you have you Christian mentioning, um, you know, that last service that you went to? I, I have an experience with like a, a service that I had gone to that I was like, that was more of like, a, I'm just not going to be part of this church anymore kind of experience. But Casey, you're I mean, you've been out for a while. Did you just fizzle out or did you have any service where you were like, what, like the fuck this kind of service? Um, I just kind of had like a buildup of experiences. Yeah. Uh, but something that happened that once I left my church, well, once once I was away from my church, when I was at Liberty, there was a situation that happened there that uh, it was a big turnoff for me. Um, it was basically they had this this guy that was a friend of mine, not a close friend, but somebody we had gone to that little school together and stuff. Uh, he was the youth pastor at my church for a while, and he was great 
he's a great dude, a uh, kind person that was a true believer. And he took this little youth group that was insular and not really doing anything and just like open the doors to the community. So they were doing all these like really cool things. Like they had like video game nights where they had all these different consoles yeah, yeah. set up with guitar hero and stuff. I mean, they had a couple hundred kids there at this church that, you know, had a couple hundred members yeah. normally and just a bunch of stuff like that. Like it was really thriving. And I remember coming back to visit, you know, and April came with me and uh, I was just like, I, this is, this is amazing. Like, I can't believe that he's been able to build this, but um, there was another guy that was a friend of his and uh, nobody liked him. <laughs> none of the, none of the main people in the church liked him. Uh, I think he was, so he was a nice dude. He was like maybe a, a little effeminate or something like that was, I think, part of why people didn't like him. And there was a couple of situations that happened where stuff blew up. They made a big deal out of him. But there was nothing wrong with this guy. He was a yeah. good dude. And um, somebody at one point found porn on the church computer. So cool. one of the one of the office computers in the church, somebody had been using it to look at porn. So they set up like a sting operation <laughs> to get whoever was doing it. And they all thought that it was this, this guy that they didn't like. Oh, right. Yeah. So it was a big deal. Like they, they, you know, kind of waited around. I don't know if they used the camera or if they waited around a certain time of day, whatever it was, it was my buddy, the youth pastor. Nice. <laughs> and so they, uh, he's so repressed. He can't even wait until he gets home to, <laughs> right he has to do it at well, church and you you had to know the dude but like he was one of those guys that was like when he was caught he was like it's true it was me i'm so sorry i have a problem i really just want to you know i need i need help and i'm looking at and i mean for god's sake he was looking at some porn <laughs> but he uh he decided like he really wanted to be open about it and confess and like, you know, ask the church for help. And then he was going to do the go through the steps of whatever they needed him to do, you know, to help him with that problem. Right. So he got in front of the whole church and uh, basically said, like, hey, this was me. I have a problem with pornography. Uh, it's become an issue for me and I don't remember, all, I don't know all the details, but he, he did it publicly and they crucified him. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. That's not funny, but I just, <laughs> 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 but it's, uh, I was really that's, expecting him to become the poster react. boy for addiction recovery at your church. <laughs> oh no, they, they destroyed him. So they sent him off to like a weekend retreat with his wife <laughs> for like pornography problems and then <laughs> fired him and then fired him. Yeah. They, they, they ditched him and so much for forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was just one of, it was one of those places where like, you know, if, if I was older, if I would have been there for the service and stuff, I would have just probably felt like standing up and saying, all right, guys, let's just, you know, for the sake of honesty, let anyone who has never looked at pornography, Stand up, please, so that we can commend you. <laughs> you know, like just a bunch of hypocrites. But this guy who was like turning the church into something, you know, he was like really investing himself in this place. The first person to do that in a long time. And like the minute something happens that they don't like, they're like, ah, out, be gone. So they gave the position to another guy who is a total dud. He ruined all those programs. I mean, immediately like shut down all of the things that they were doing. And it just shriveled up back into what it was before. Wow. And then that guy got caught at a rest stop and <laughs> <laughs> he's the pastor there now. <laughs> really worked his way up. That, that's like his lifelong dream. He uh, asked me for a donation the other day because he's starting a uh, family counseling ministry or something like that. Great. Those always work out well. They tell you really fun things that don't hurt wives. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I guess, I, Christian, I want to actually get like, we usually, I want to hear about like when you started, how long has Christian Nightmares been going on? Uh, when did you start that? And like, how did this, like, when did it like start turning into something where you're like, oh, Jesus, people are really finding this attractive. Um, I started a while ago now. It started in, um, in 2009. 
Really? Um, yeah. Um, I had I had been thinking about doing something like Christian Nightmares for a while, but um, you know, I talked to people about building a website for me and or something, and they were like, "Oh yeah, for a couple thousand bucks, I can do this." And I'm like, <laughs> crazy, you know. And then uh, and then Tumblr came oh, along. Before Squarespace. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, the Tumblr came along and I was like, oh, wow, I can post on here for free and kind of say whatever I want. So I just uh, I just started kind of Googling um, uh, memories from my past, like people and, and sermon topics and, um, you know, ridiculous stuff like backmasking and and uh, just stuff that I remembered. Uh, you said backmasking? Yeah. Do you, you know what that is? enlightened because this sounds fun it's not putting your mask back on in the middle of a pandemic is it <laughs> no it's um yeah i guess i i am a little older than you guys I, it was from, um it was playing records backwards and, <laughs> oh. and looking for subliminal messages yeah. um, I def- okay i didn't know it had a term i love that <laughs> yeah um that was a big thing when i was growing up we used to have these guys come to the church and and play records backwards and you know, <laughs> they did that at your church. Yeah. yeah. So fun. What were some of the ones they played backwards? It's like, there's, there's some of them are pretty well known. Like queen, like another one bites the dust is uh, it's fun to smoke marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, <laughs> a Led Zeppelin song. I think stare to heaven is um, here's to my sweet Satan. Oh, um, I think I heard, I've heard of that one. Does it really say, I've never heard these actually played backwards. Does it, when you hear it, do you only I mean, think it, it says that because someone told you it does, like a Rorschach test or something? It's it's more of that, I think. I mean, yeah. I mean, this guy would come up and say, and they, he would tell you exa- what he thinks they said, and then he played for you, and of course you hear that, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I just started. I just started. Uh, um, yeah, googling all that stuff and, and started posting on Christian nightmares, and then pretty early on. Um, I found this video. You guys may have seen it. it. Was a while ago. It was about the Christian side hug. Okay, um, yeah, like it's um, mocking side hugs, right? Is it like, or is this being a serious this was video? For real, as far as I could tell, it was a uh, you know just about how you know uh, you shouldn't be hugging somebody. Christians shouldn't be hugging you know the regular way that you're hugging from the side, you know, because it's, it's it's impure if you're if you're you know hugging somebody. Um, you know, face to face like that. Um, these guys, like really terrible rappers like did a song about it and I posted it on Christian nightmares <laughs> and somebody picked it up. I think it was, it was maybe, um, it was, do you remember the site Gawker? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It was a website. Oh, you said Gawker? Gawker. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember that. Um, they, they picked it up and that, it, it kind of went sort of viral. Um, and then, um, so that kind of put Christian nightmares on the map. Um, and then I just, I was getting some good feedback. People seemed to be really responding to it. Um, I even got a, like an email from this musician that I really like and respect who was like, oh man, this is, this stuff is great. You've like made me fall in love with the internet again. And so I, th- I felt really encouraged by that. And, nice. um, and really for me, it was just, um, I don't know. I had to, I wanted to look at all of this stuff through adult eyes and see how it affected me because so much of it had had such a negative effect on me growing up. Um, and you know, I don't know if this, I don't know if I would recommend this for anybody, but it was almost like I, I just watched this stuff over and over again as a way to almost kind of desensitize myself to it. If that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of needed to, and again, I don't, I wouldn't recommend it, but it was just, uh, it, it almost kind of, kind of worked. And, and in some ways, you know, I was just, I was able to look at it and say, man, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, how was I ever afraid of this? Or how was I, <laughs> you know, upset by this? Or, you know, some of it was, uh, you know, some of it was really uncomfortable to watch, but over time it, it, it kind of helped me. Um, and then as a community kind of built, you know, started to grow from this, you know, that was, that made me want to do it even more. Um, I've met so many amazing people through Christian nightmares and yeah. I've had so many great conversations and in, in email exchanges and um, yeah. So that's, that's what's, what's made me want to keep going with it. That's awesome. Uh, man, I, you talking about desensitizing yourself to this stuff, which is probably the only way you can like not absolutely go insane while searching for it regularly and posting it. But I feel like I could probably use a little bit of that when it comes to uh, like, 
prophecy end times prophecy videos i keep seeing those get shared from time to time and i'm like every time i hear those i'm just like how as an adult like how do you like how do you think after all these times that people have predicted things that after every democrat who's ever been president (laughs) we're at the end of the world like how do you still buy into this silly story of a predicted end. I just, man, it gets me really riled up. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm starting to think Obama's playing the long game. <laughs> Wait, what's that? So I'm starting to think Obama's got like a long game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd also, I think doing Christian Nightmares, it felt good to start doing that and still does just because for so many years I had to sit in church and keep my mouth shut. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't, re- I couldn't really respond to what was being being said and preached at me uh, the way I wanted to. And so this has given me an opportunity to say exactly how I feel about it. Yeah. Without um, dealing with, man, that, yeah, I, could, I imagine that must have felt super cathartic to just post and say it in any way, in any way that you're feeling at the time without having to just worry about rephrasing it or editing this or editing that to, to make it more palatable for people. I, I bet that felt pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I just, I felt so stifled all those years too. And I also, I think even, you know, being anonymous and wearing a mask, I've thought about that a little bit too. Like I, I think I, I've, I've kind of always felt like I wore a mask in a way mm. uh, cause I was one person in my regular life when I was with my, with my friends and my secular friends. And, and then I, I was a totally different person and I kind of had to just kind of smile and nod and go along with it um, at church. So it, it, it's felt it feels really good to to not have to be to be phony yeah um, anymore mm-hmm. even though i'm wearing a mask yeah <laughs> yeah um, well and that, a, it, it kind of helps your page stand i think there's a uh i mean i don't know if you're familiar with like mf doom i don't know if that's even oh, yeah. close but yeah. like he i mean i mean rest rest in peace of course he yeah, uh i know that was like a bummer of like everything going on and the, I mean, yeah. it's already been a shitty week and then you find out i mean i guess he's been he actually died a good few months back and they didn't even no one knew but yeah. i mean he always wore the mask and people always got super annoyed like some people would get annoyed about it especially when he would have like pete and he would book shows and not play them because <laughs> <It's> <laughs> somebody else in a mask but it helps keep your page um even separate from like you uh, i think there's a, a plus side to having it be its own thing and not just about you or your and you or whoever you are in your individualness it's just like you know it doesn't really necessarily confuse the two and it allows you to kind of probably have a, a nice healthy partition in some ways yeah i think so and that that is part of the thinking behind it too is um yeah i i, I don't want it to be about me you know i want it to I, I like the idea that this character of christian nightmares could be anybody yeah yeah, it's about all of us who are on it, looking at it, and <laughs> right, exactly. feeling at home there. Everybody who's experienced this stuff. Has there been backlash? Yeah, I mean, that's another reason why I'm anonymous, too. Um, I get some pretty aggressive and uh, angry hate mail. Oh, yeah. Um, at times, and, and especially during, you know, the Trump years and everything that's, you know, uh, it's, I don't, I don't know if I want my name attached to this. It's it's kind of you know there's some pretty pretty scary unhinged people out there yeah Dude, they're not threatening they're witnessing <laughs> oh right well. didn't, you, um, didn't you post a video of a uh of a, some mega pastor and didn't wasn't there uh i feel like i saw something on your page about you getting your cease and desist or something like that was that yeah i did he uh yeah i yeah so nothing you got- does that happen a lot? Like, do you, uh, you get like, I mean, maybe not to that degree, but when you post these videos of pastors and tag them, do you hear from the churches or their offices very much? Sometimes I do. Yeah. But what's funny to me is, you know, I don't take anything out of context or, or edit the videos at all. It's, just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm posting <laughs> exactly what they said and then they're getting mad. I mean, I, I, I understand that I'm putting it in a context of, you know, under the label of Christian nightmares, but I'm really just sharing what they said. And if the um, power of the Holy Spirit is really in their words, they should just be thankful that it's getting out there. Exactly. Yes. Who knows who it's going to be? How many people do you think you've saved through Christian nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nobody. 
Dude, so you're behind even Sam in the soul winning award. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the? the- <laughs> no i was just gonna say i had like i bought in to the i I tried to save my friends and i I was like i have i have two friends who uh i i mean witness to to a pretty i mean i brought one of these friends to an acquire the fire um event yeah um and then another one of my friends i had called i mean that the acquire the fire is like you do a church sleepover you i mean and then you all go it's like the message was insane and then and then we go to and then after my first semester at liberty i i called another friend whose mom he was a kid i was in a band with in high school but his his mom had gone to church and a non-denominational church that i thought was a good the good kind and um he i called him and probably talked to him for an hour just trying to like convert him to follow jesus and um I asked both of them about those experiences recently uh, since starting this podcast. And they were like, both of them both said, I don't even remember that. (laughs) I was like, what? (laughs) It's so wild. It was like, I've been thinking about that for over 10 years. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. I used to have to um, do door to door evangelism and and standing on, uh, sit on corners, handing out tracks. Too. Oh wow, man! That's you have, <laughs> special, really you have some special experiences that are like not common even among <laughs> the the crazy side of things like that. In the in the Sunday do nothing thing, like that's <laughs> that's something else. It's no fun. So you, I mean, that was no TV. No, I mean that was like you. Did you really some like have Sundays where you would just have to you would sit and like either, literally do nothing except read your Bible and talk? To your Pretty family? much, yeah. Wow. Pretty much, yeah. Sometimes did you guys ever? <laughs> What's up? Did did you, did you guys ever do the uh, the abortion protests? Did you do those, Sam? No, I, I, didn't. I didn't. Thankfully. Oh I didn't. well, that's that's something we did that was kind of wild. Oh, did you? We stood on the street corner and held signs silently. It was like uh, I don't I don't remember the name of the day, but it was like an annual thing. They did it at Liberty too. Kids would walk around and hold signs sometimes. I feel like the only thing we protested was, um, <laughs> this is, the, the, when it comes to like issues to be dogmatic about, uh, given all the things that there are that Christians could protest to their serious to them. I find it hilarious that the only thing my family ever protested was because, uh, in Massachusetts they were doing, they were initiating, um, or had passed a lot, whatever the standardized test that you have to take to graduate high school, the um, MCAS. And yeah. I was homeschooled and homeschooled parents were livid about that. They were like, there's absolutely no way we want our children having to pass a standardized test to graduate high school, like all the other kids. So there was a mass <laughs> protest of homeschoolers uh, at the state house. And there was a ton of lobbying and a shitload of money spent on it, I presume. And to this day, kids who are homeschooled still do not have to take MCAS. Oh really? Wow. So I mean of course the homeschooled parents are like they're hiding behind whatever excuse they have uh but really they're all just like my kid is absolutely not going to be smart enough to pass any standardized test. Like <laughs> I like when you there's just so many kids that I knew who were like they weren't going to college, they were going to I don't know, who knows what they're going to do afterwards but it's like I mean, a lot of people are just fine because it's not like the the test isn't super rigorous or anything like that. Uh, it, so without taking it, I mean, you still have your transcripts and you have to maybe take an entry exam into a college or something like that. But I, I don't know. Dude, I they should make the that. parents take a standardized test. Like, <laughs> oh, you want a whole school? Okay. <laughs> What's 12 times 12? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And my homeschool education really was fine. So I'm like, I was worried that it wasn't, but I remember, I, but I'll, I remember being there with all those people thinking like, I don't, I, not, I remember thinking that this was like, I was excited about it and hoping it worked because I was just scared that of tests like any other kids. So you're like, I'm in on this. Like, right. I mean, I was probably 10, 11, 12. I don't know. Like I wasn't old when they were doing that. You're opposed to all tests on, on principle. <laughs> were you guys both in school? Just me. I, yeah, Sam. I was Christian school. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, he so. was the K through 12 Christian school. Yeah. We had to do standardized testing. We did this the CAT, I think was ours. I can't imagine what our scores looked like. <laughs> I always did fine on mine, but I'm sure that there were some pretty rough ones. Man, we didn't even ask you, uh, Christian. You went to, did you go to public school? I did, yeah. I went to public school all the way through. Man. See, yet another problematic area. I, See, I, can really, I can really point back at the things that they lost, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't, have, we didn't have a lot of money you know, when I was growing up. So I don't, I think that that had something to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, like not being able to send me to a private school or a Christian school. I mean, I don't even know we're Christian schools. You have to pay to go to Christian school, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of them, even though you get, you're paying for what, what, probably a terrible education. It costs a lot of money for some, <laughs> a lot of time. Dude, yeah. Our school was, uh, you had to pay to go there, but you got a huge discount. If you, as a parent volunteered as a teacher, <laughs> so there was, like, was never more than like six people teaching quote unquote at our school and one of them was a teacher the rest of them were not man so i'm just here for the discount and the uh free cartons of milk oh. i didn't graduate from high school myself but oh no 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 i'm saying the teachers that were oh, i was like this sounds, i was like we could have gotten to a whole new story you didn't graduate high school and you were yeah, out got nervous for a second <laughs> <laughs> man dude, this has been a awesome conversation I, I really appreciate you coming on and just talking to us about your story and the beginning of christian nightmares this has been awesome likewise yeah it's really great talking with you guys so. all right everybody thanks for listening and we will catch you next oh wait no uh yeah, have- if you want to see more about uh christian nightmares it's i, I know on instagram it's at christian underscore nightmares and then uh do you still is Tumblr still kind of like your hub? I'm not really posting there as much. I do occasionally, but um, I'm on Twitter too. I post there quite a bit, but he's got a yeah. link tree in his, uh, in the Instagram profile. So you can find all the other stuff in places to follow on there. I Definitely highly recommend follow. it. It's hilarious. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. And then Casey, what, what do we got? We're on, uh, I don't know, everything now. You can find our podcast everywhere. We're on everything now. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, Audible, you name it. We're pretty much everywhere. Great. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Have a good one, everybody. See you.